the Magic Archer initiates his attack at 7 tiles, and it shoots 11 tiles far. He can't snipe the King Tower from across the river. However, if there is any unit in the center of the map and a tower is down, he can just barely reach the King Tower for that sweet snipe. It's always good to know how much damage a card does left alone. This lets you gauge how threatening it is to leave it ignored. 500 damage in the tower means you can afford to ignore him with beatdown decks. His arrow has a piercing effect and most importantly, it has a 0.25 tile splash radius. Check out how he pierces through Skarmy. He's nowhere near as efficient as the Executioner, but he is fast. This is what makes him deadly. He can one-shot skeletons, fire spirits, and bats. Even though bats die in one shot, his arrow is very thin, so you can actually surround him with bats right as he crosses the bridge to fully deny him. Though you have to be careful, since he does have a 7 tile attack range, he locks onto the tower really fast like a dart goblin does. So if you mess up, you're in for a world of hurt. His range is massive, he practically insta-locks onto the princess, so it's harder to stop him from chipping your princess tower when one is down. On the topic of range, he wrecks Bowler's knockback mechanic. He's fragile, but he can actually take out a Bowler for a positive elixir trade. If you get too greedy and plant him too far back, the Bowler will knock him out of range, and the Bowler will just lock onto your Princess Tower and deal that 500 damage. Another interesting thing is that he is just strong enough to stop one bandit. It's all about angles. In a perfect world, he can two-shot three minions straight up. They'll die in two shots, nice and swift. But you can also use minions to counter an unprotected magic archer just like with bats. His projectile is as fast as a dark goblin. The difference? It doesn't lock onto any target, so it can be outpaced easily. Take for example the minion splitting. It really distracts him and leaves him vulnerable. Generally speaking, you're going to want to watch out for very fast moving troops to keep in mind the angle in which you place him, especially those infinite ninja turtles. He'll literally let every single spear goblin connect onto your tower at full health. The goblin hut is finished before you can even touch it if it's placed inefficiently. The interaction with the minion horde is different because of the formation of the horde. Straight on, he is only piercing two minions. He is going to get wrecked. Treat it like any other ranged card and pull the minion horde. Doing this pulls them out of formation into a nice solid shape to snipe more than two minions at a time. He takes minimal damage and can wreck the horde. When they counter your push with the minion horde and then they counter attack with a miner, you actually have enough time to position your magic archer at the best angle to assault that miner. You'll need an ice spirit or an ice golem to minimize the damage done. He can also 3-shot Archers, Princess, and Dark Goblin. It's not too strong, but it is effective. It's worth remembering this interaction for when these troops are supported behind a tank. In terms of real gameplay, how do you use him? He has two major functions. The first function is to defend against major beatdown pushes. He wrecks a giant, night witch, and musketeer, and literally deals 1200 damage to the tower because that giant is in position for him to perfectly chip the tower. In this real gameplay example, I noticed my opponent put a golem in the back, so I decided to punish him hard. To ensure he had no elixir to wipe out my magic archer, I used a minor. In this real gameplay example, I noticed my opponent put a golem in the back, so I decided to punish him hard. To ensure he had no elixir to wipe out my magic archer, I used a minor graveyard on the right side to force him to use log and archers. Then I played the magic archer to snipe the golem, pierce his princess tower for 600 damage, tornado to wipe out the skeletons, and those golemites barely tickled my princess tower. His second function is to chip away at the tower at every opportunity that makes sense. I needed to bring the tower down to 293 so I can lightning it. With the power of geometry, 
I took advantage of his residual archers to position my magic archer to pierce his princess tower. Is it worth it to chip their tower? On a macro level of things, it depends. Do you have a positive lead? Are you running a chip cycle archetype? Can you afford to be down one elixir? Have you pressured the other side so that they can't counter your magic archer right at the bridge? You have to decide when it's worth it and when it's not. Against three musketeers, pair the magic archer with the log. Time it correctly, deploy both cards at the same time, and you're going to be able to completely shut down two musketeers and chip that tower for 500 damage. As the 3M player, it's really hard to react to this. The Magic Archer has a 7 tile range. You have to predict when they're going to play that Magic Archer, and you're going to have to preemptively play an Ice Golem. Let's take another look at his second function of chipping. Let's say I had a residual knight that countered a miner on my side. Left alone, that knight is going to waddle to his princess tower and deal a lot of damage. So my opponent has to address it somehow. Let's say they go Mega Minion. Perfect! With the power of geometry, the magic archer pierces the mega minion, dealing almost a thousand damage to their princess tower and destroys that mega minion. Whenever something is planted directly in the middle lane, you can plant the magic archer on the second tile from the river to pierce the princess tower. Third tile from the river? No, no, too far. There are generally three paths a troop can take on the bridge, left, center, and right. In this case, Let's say the Ice Golem was used to defend against the Graveyard or Miner and is traveling on the left side. You'll have to place the Magic Archer one tile to the left. Not believing in the power of geometry means you're going to fail to hit the tower. If an Ice Golem or any ground unit is planted behind the King Tower, it's going to be on the inner side of the bridge. So in this case, placing him one tile to the right ensures he pierces the Prince's Tower for that sweet, sweet free damage. Placed on the second tile, he'll hit the center planted expo and hit the tower nine or so times thanks to that expo's positioning. But a veteran expo player will stagger their expo. This means the magic archer will not be able to hit the expo from the same position on the second tile from the river. When an expo is staggered, you need to plant the archer directly in front of the river. This happens because all units in the game have a circular hitbox. So since the expo is staggered, that hitbox is slightly farther away from the magic archer's arrow. This is a cool interaction, but any respectable expo player will outcycle your magic archer. His health is too low for you to risk planting him in front of all of that danger, especially compared to an executioner or bowler since they have much more health. Ice spirit, zap. Let's do one more collector so we can get a real big surge and maybe get that double clone off as he freezes. Ice Spirit, Zap, Collector, Rage, Magic Archer. I'll start moving them slightly closer to the bridge now. One more pump and that's the end of the pump game. Magic Archer, Magic Archer, Zap, Ice Spirit. Rage over here, Magic Archer, Magic Archer, Zap, Ice Golem, Ice Spirit, Magic Archer, here we go. Clone, clone, zap, oh. Oh my goodness, what's that? 5, 10, 15, 20, 20, I think it's about 30. About 30, that was pretty epic. That wouldn't have enough range to safely snipe it without the Princess Tower taking him out. However, since passive buildings have a much larger hitbox, you can actually snipe a hut Five tiles from the river with a magic archer. He's decent at countering goblin barrel. If you place him on the inside, he won't tank any hits from the goblin and they'll still deal 300 damage to your tower. But if you plant him on the outside, he tanks that goblin and the goblins will only have managed to deal 200 damage on your tower. So all of this is scary because he has so much potential but Fireball wrecks him. Ice Spirit almost completely stops this 4 Elixir card. I'd say it's a positive trade. He only deals 96 damage to your Prince's Tower, and now you're up 3 Elixir. To put that into perspective, how great an Ice Spirit counters the Magic Archer. The Musketeer deals almost 200 damage, even when stopped by an Ice Spirit. This is like Fireball damage to your tower.
Can you activate the King Tower with a Tornado? You will need an Ice Golem or an Ice Spirit paired with that Tornado for that extra oomph. It's 5 Elixir for 4, but it's totally worth it if it's within the first minute of the game. But wait! There's more! You can activate the King Tower with an Ice Spirit. You can do this consistently, but you need to memorize these general tiles. It's 4 for 4, so I'd say it's worth it. Can you activate him without Tornado? Yeah, but only if units behind him push him forward and closer to the King Tower. In this case, the Stab Goblins did. Does it happen in real games? There are lots of occasions when your opponent will have units behind the Magic Archer and he'll totally get pushed forward. Lil Lamon from Orange Pulp had this happen to him in the draft challenge. The Magic Archer does have a massive sight range, so an Ice Golem will actually be able to kite him into the other lane. A knight can counter him very, very well, but never place the knight directly in front of him. Why give your opponent free damage to your tower? Stagger the knight one tile off center, and he'll wreck the Magic Archer with no collateral damage to your princess tower. Barbarians do counter him, but come on, they're 5 elixir. They counter all unsupported ground troops. Some interesting interaction is that he actually dies in one hit to a mini P.E.K.K.A. He vanishes in just one swing. A prince can kill him in two swings, or one charge strike. It's such a satisfying thing seeing a 4 elixir card melt into elixir from one boing. Even though he two shots goblins and spear goblins, the gang is still enough to stop him from touching your tower. The arrow's splash radius is simply too small. A Night Witch two shots the Magic Archer. Mega Minion is pretty juicy too. Two hits and he's gone. Valkyries kill him in three hits too. Of course she moves really slow so she won't be able to reach him from the enemy's side. But what's really great is that she has a 360 spin splash. Magic Archer is most certainly going to be behind tanks and this is where she shines. Thanks for watching.